kindly um, mute your microphone, please. So lessen the background noise and to mute your microphone, select the microphone icon at the bottom left corner of the Zoom call. When the icon has a red slash through it, it's muted. And also during the Q&A, kindly use the chat function, kindly type in your question briefly and clearly. And the questions given during the registration have been collated and will be discussed during the Q&A session. Once again, good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the third of the four Econ Security Talks presented to you by Frederick Ebert Stift on Philippines, Fax Asia, and Amador Research Services. For everybody's information as well, the organizers, Frederick Ebert Stift on Philippines, Fax Asia, and Amador Research Services strive to ensure a high level of security for your personal data. The organizers will comply with the Philippines Data Privacy Act governing data that was gathered as part of the registration process and during this event and the evaluation. All right, so we are all excited to learn this afternoon from the insights of our speakers, and I understand that they are all here, and we would like to formally start our event proper. So the Philippines Archipelago Strategic Location, ideal coastlines and abundant um, marine resources in its surrounding oceans and internal waters are brimming with economic opportunities. And the country is ranked 11 among the top 25 major producers of marine capture and inland capture. So coastal and marine tourism, a key component of the country's ocean-based industry has contributed an estimated 3 billion US dollars in value added to the economy and provides employment to 900,000 workers. So while the Philippine Ocean's economic potential is underutilized, it is also challenged by adverse anthropogenic practices such as pollution and unsustainable fishing practices, and more detrimentally, the impacts of climate change that will greatly affect the ocean's health. So given the high potential of the sector, it is crucial that the current administration consider the blue economy as part of the National Development Plan and it would be interesting to explore how the Philippines can utilize different strategies to advance the sector, such as community engagement, public-private partnerships, and bilateral or regional cooperation. So this third webinar will focus on the blue economy and will include discussions on how bilateral or multilateral strategic partnerships can help increase traction in the sector, as well as how to incorporate sustainability and inclusion principles in its development. So ladies and gentlemen, today we intend to explore, analyze and generate strategies to advance the sector and to foster dialogue with relevant stakeholders in the Philippines. And in connection to this, we count on the insights of our great speakers and their expertise in this matter. So friends, we begin as we will give the floor this time to Dr. Vincent Huzo. Resident Representative of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Philippines for the opening remarks. Dr. Huzo. Thank you so much, Diane. Magalang hapon and welcome to our third Econ Security Talk entitled Achieving Economic Security Through Blue Economy. I'm very pleased that so many of you are taking part and maybe taking part again. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Philippines, the Foundation for National Interest, Amador Research Services, and Facts Asia. When we talk about the sea here in the Philippines, it initially has something very romantic or very traditional about it. We think of the fisherman howling in his full nets at sunset and bringing home his catch. But when we talk about blue economy, we are talking about a multitude of topics and problems faced by this fisherman. Problems for which he himself is not, or let's say only partially responsible and which he certainly cannot solve on his own. The ocean is part of the Filipino identity. A multitude of explosive political topics can be derived from the ocean. Issues of territorial integrity, questions about environmental protection, 
about the livelihoods and particularly um, of the poor population group, about the commercial exploitation of maritime resources and questions of civil protection issues and disaster response. And of course, I'm saying that today at the background of the horrible pictures we are already seeing of uh, the effect of Paeng, the tropical depression um, we will experience also during the next days. To a large extent, these questions I raised are all interconnected. With today's discussion, we want to face these questions, but we also want to go beyond that and we want to examine where the opportunities of the blue economy lie for the Philippines and also neighboring countries. Therefore, I will also be about how the Philippines and neighboring countries can deal with the habitat and the resource ocean. Sustainability is a key issue. How do we manage to sustainably develop our economy, our society without further destroying our livelihoods? And how do we manage to create a common international set of rules on the basis of which the use of the maritime resources and their project protections are equally guaranteed? Well, questions upon questions to which I hope to find at least some answers today. But I have little doubt about that because we are very lucky to have esteemed speakers, outstanding personalities and experts who will share their knowledge, their perspective and innovative ideas on how to achieve economic security via the blue economy. Welcome and thank you for being with us today, Mr. Michael Huang, Senior Research Fellow at the Ocean Policy Research Institute, Dr. Ben Milligan, Secretariat Director of the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership, Dr. Maria Angela Safra, Executive Director of the Strategia Development Research Institute, and Dr. Dio Florence Onda, Deputy Director for Research of the Marine Science Institute. Thank you so much for being with us today. Finally, I would like to thank our partners and of course my team from FES Philippines again for preparing today's talk. And of course, this also applies to the charming moderation of Bian. Thank you so much for that. And last but not least, I would like to invite you today already for our next talk we are planning. This will take place on November 29th and we will look at the topic of digital economy strategies and security. But now the stage is free. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat and mabuhay. Maraming salamat din po at mabuhay, Dr. Huzel. Well, Dr. Huzel already mentioned that we have experts and great speakers this afternoon and we will not prolong any more the excitement as I will introduce to you our first speaker for today's discussion. So our first speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Maria Angela G. Safra. Dr. Safra is the co-founder and executive director of Strategy and Development Research Institute Incorporated, a nonprofit research organization focused on providing policy research, capacity building, and technical assistance in various social and economic development areas. Dr. Safra has a doctorate in business administration from the Ateneo de Davao University, a master's in management from the University of the Philippines, Mindanao, and a bachelor's in environmental science from the Ateneo de Manila University. And most recently, she completed a postgraduate certificate in public policy from the University of Waikato in New Zealand as a New Zealand ASEAN scholar. Dr. Zafra also has extensive international experience, having completed several prestigious fellowships. Ladies and gentlemen and friends, let's have our first speaker and give our virtual applause to Dr. Maria Angela G. Safra. Dr. Safra, you may now take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar. My presentation this afternoon is about developing the Philippine economy, the blue economy, opportunities and challenges in the ocean tourism sector. Let me just share my screen. 
we this uh this presentation is actually a part of the ADBI book. It's one chapter uh, edited by Dr. Wang, who's also a speaker this afternoon. Um, we started the development of this book um, around late 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, because we started writing this book in 2020, but it was published this year. The data used in this research was did not include um, tourism trends over the COVID-19 pandemic. So the data that we use up was up to like 2019 at this point. Yeah. So this presentation aims to explore how ocean tourism and economic development are intertwined in archipelagic nations like the Philippines. This will be done by examining national statistical data on tourism and economic development um, and the trends throughout the years. Furthermore, this paper discusses policy landscape that provides support to the development of ocean tourism in the country. I updated a bit of the information. Uh, for instance, um, there are a lot of definition of the ocean economy or blue economy. Um, but for now, um, we are referring to the official definition by the Philippine Statistics Authority. So this, um, what I'm showing you right now, is what we as a country use as our official definition of ocean economy. No. So the keywords here would be economic activity, so it has to have a contribution to the Philippine economy, indicated as contribution to GDP. And um, the economic activity should involve the ocean or marine environments, whether as outputs, as inputs, or as the location of the economic activity. So prior to the development of the PSA Ocean Economy Satellite Account, PEMC provided an estimation of our blue economy. So the Philippines ocean economy um, covers all of this activity. And you can see that for the Philippines, coastal and marine tourism really covers a significant amount of economic activity, covering about a fourth or 25% of our economic activity. And then fisheries and aquaculture, manufacturing, um, ha also have significant contribution to the economy. And then we have the other sectors. So if you notice, the blue economy or ocean economy is really all encompassing, um, cross-cutting across different uh, sectors and different uh, industries as well. Because by the nature of our very country, we're in, we're surrounded by oceans, we're an island country, there's lots of islands. So a lot of our economic activity will really be part of the blue economy. So the ocean economy contributes US $11.9 billion in gross value added, which is a significant amount of our country's uh, GDP. So in 2018 and 19, that's when the PSA, the Philippine Statistics Authority, started measuring the contribution of ocean wealth in the Philippines in the form of the ocean economy satellite account of the PSA. So the ones at the bottom, so ocean-based industries, so these are the particular industries that are included in the computation of the satellite accounts. So if you can see, um, tourism is actually disaggregated because coastal accommodation and food and beverage service activities considered to be one segment. And then coastal recreation is also considered to be another segment. So in this case, there's no specific, uh, in the Philippine definition, uh, there's no specific uh, sub-account just for tourism itself. No, it's disaggregated somewhere. So as you can see, uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the ocean-based industries were really growing, especially when you talk about ocean-based tourism. However, due to COVID-19, the ocean economy declined by 32.6% lower, no, um, which is quite significant uh, compared to the 16.1% growth in 2019. So, the measurement of PSA uh, is quite different compared to the initial me um, measurement of PEMC. Because in the PEMC measurement, you can see that um, tourism is really the top uh, contribution to the economy. 
So here, when you talk about the PSA version, no? so ocean fishing is the largest country share of the ocean economy, followed by logistics and also manufacture, uh, followed by manufacture and also logistics. So tourism and other significant uh, other sectors of the ocean economy uh, makes up about a quarter. No, but if you can see, fishing is really the biggest chunk. The Philippines, when we talk about ocean wealth, we almost always look at, you know, biodiversity and ocean, um, the richness of the ocean, so to speak. Because the Philippines is located in what is known as the Coral Triangle, which is a marine area that is home to the greatest number of coral species in the world, as well as other reef-dependent biodiversity, such as sea turtles and fish. Two weeks ago, I was diving in Bohol, and when you dive, you can really appreciate you know, the wealth um, that the ocean provides us. It's able to see a lot of sea turtles, a lot of schools of fish, and it underscores how important the oceans are to us. So coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses provide a combined benefit of around $6.2 billion each year. No, in terms of um, net annual benefits. So there is actually what we call a measurement of ocean health index. No. The Philippines scored 61 out of 100 and ranked 171st amongst 226 countries in 2018. The score is lower than the global average of 71. This indicates that the Philippines seems to have been exploiting the ocean and marine resources in ways that are not sustainable. If you noticed, tourism and recreation received the lowest score of 16, significantly below the goal of 52. This was a time wherein you know, all that issues with Boracay, uh, El Nido, and similar locations were front news. This is interesting because it's estimated that Marine tourism is a big chunk of the ocean economy. And then when we look at it, coastal livelihood, the score is only 45, which is only half the target of 82. These scores indicate that ocean-dependent livelihoods and revenues are not maintained and livelihood quality is maximized. It's not maximized. This is important because for a developing country like the Philippines, livelihoods needs to be inclusive and sustainable. No, we have to provide livelihoods for Filipinos. And what do we keep on saying? That the poorest of the poor are always the farmers and the fisher folk. Fisher folk who make their living from the sea, but are the poorest of the poor. No. So there is really a need to make ocean wealth more inclusive. So you can see here, the one on the right is an updated version no. So we've improved slightly uh, in 2020, 68. So you notice the biggest change is actually in tourism and recreation because that's post-rehabilitation, post-crackdown on you know, unsustainable tourism. Um, and because during the pandemic, you know, a lot of things change. So in a way, the pandemic uh, improved ecosystems um, because there's limited human activity. So I guess that's one of the reasons why the scores have improved as well. So I'm now I'm actually a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Climate Change Commission. So the NPT is sort of like the advisory um, of the Climate Change Commission um, when it comes to scientific matters. So part of our role as the NPTE was to identify what are the top 10 risks that we are experience, that we are vulnerable to in relation to climate change. And if you notice, a lot of these risks are related to the ocean, to marine environments. So for instance, sea level rise, coastal erosion, flooding in a way is also related to the ocean. Um, frequent and severe typhoons would have a corresponding effect on the, on coastal environments. Coastal cities and municipalities are of the greatest risk when we talk about um, 
severe typhoons. And as mentioned by Diane, we are in the mid middle of one right now. Um, and then we have, of course, biodiversity loss. No, very important because there's a significant biodiversity um, endangerment and loss in our marine environments. So this underscores you know, how climate change poses a threat, poses a security risk, poses an economic risk to the Philippines in general, but most especially to our coastal and marine environments. So you can definitely say that you know, it is climate change and its cor corresponding risks are a national security issue. You, know, you can correlate it to that. So now we segue to tourism, which is one of the subsectors of the blue economy and one of the sectors that is of primary concern in the Philippine economy because um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's also starting to come back right now, tourism is a driver of the Philippine economy. You know, it has a contribution of around 10 to 12 percent of GDP, which is quite significant. So you can see here that how tourism has grown over the years. So in 2018, the country welcomed 7.1 million international tourist visitors, while 111 million domestic trips were taken by locals. With um, a lot of tourism infrastructure was constructed over the last decade, such as airports, seaports, you know, to cope with in increasing tourist numbers. The tourism domestic gross value added receipts reached 2.2 trillion pesos in 2018, and the chair um, against the country's GDP has risen from 9% in 2014 to almost 13% at its peak. No. The tourism sector has accomplished the goal of more than 10% contribution to GDP years ahead of its 2022 target. With its 8% share of Philippine total exports, inbound tourism expenditure, or the expenditure of international visitors, within the Philippines ranks third amongst the biggest export items. Because yes, it's considered as the part of the calculation of our export. The share of domestic tourism expenditure to household final consumption expenditure has grown from 13.1% in 2014 to 19.8% in 2018. As a benefit on transitioning from, from a lower middle income economy to an upper middle income bracket over the next several years, more and more Filipinos are encouraged to travel. For instance, I'm in Korea right now, and while I was walking around, you can really hear people speaking in Filipino. So in some touristy places, a lot of Filipinos are here right now. Employment in the tourism industry has steadily grown from 4.8 million employed persons in 2014 to 5.3 million employed persons in 2018. The share of employment in tourism compared to the total employment has also steadily risen from 12.7% in 2014 to 13% in 2018. So among ocean tourism pursuits, beach activities still provide the largest revenue stream, while diving is a growing segment. Dive tourism is one of the key product portfolios of the Department of Tourism. Mangrove ecotourism is primarily community-based ecotourism, and cruise tourism presents the largest potential for growth uh, over the long term. You know, surfing and sport fishing are present but constitute a niche market. So part of the analysis of this paper is we look at the types of different tourism, so the four different types of tourism, and then the benefit in terms of um, economic benefits, perhaps, as well as sustainability benefits. And then for each particular uh, sector, there are significant, uh, there are also a number of negative impacts, and the, the impacts that are dependent on the type of tourism it is. So, for instance, since dive tourism is under the water, you no, know, um, if the divers are not very conscious about the impacts, 
then there, we'd have loss of coral cover, for instance. Um, we'd have, you know, stirring up sediments at the bottom. And even uh, there's, there's um, divers that could illegally remove biodiversity. So for instance, and then each sector, we identify challenges as well um, for it to, de to, to develop the particular sector, but at the same time, develop it more sustainability, sustainably. You know? So for instance, ecotourism, um, when you talk about community-based ecotourism, um, it's easily implementable um, by small communities and ecotourism is the driver of what we call biodiversity friendly enterprises. So these are enterprises that are located within areas of key biodiversity, but they are able to help the community in forms of sustainable livelihood. You know? But as with most of this, you know, the trick really is um, how to balance natural conservation with economic development activity no that one is not the expense of the other no code co-benefits deriving co-benefits is a priority when you talk about tourism development and ocean development so part of this in part of this paper involves the examining of the policy landscape for ocean tourism no so we have a mix of tourism policy policies environmental policies um, and an integration of both as an archipelagic nation, the Philippines relies heavily on marine-related tourism activities. Thus, the policy framework for a blue economy is relatively well-developed and robust. No? So even as we speak, um, there are new policies that have been added over the last year. For instance, when we talk about um, the EPR law, which has been enacted this year, um, the extended producer's responsibility. So that will also be part of the policy landscape because the EPR law was really created in line with you know, marine plastic and marine litter. So in fact, given the numerous regulations of this, you can see there's a lot of policies. You know. It might be challenging for different actors to navigate the complex policy landscape because um, half of this are environmental, half are tourism related. You know, there's a lot of different government agencies involved when you talk about um, the ocean economy and the tourism policy landscape as well. So nine tourism products have been identified, including nature-based tourism, sun and beach tourism, cruise tur nautical tourism, and diving in marine tourism. So you can see that those within the square, uh, with the, the red rectangle, are the highest priority due to its attractiveness to identified markets, and it takes advantage of the Philippines' rich natural resources. Furthermore, nature-based tourism products provide the highest potential for community-based tourism. Yeah. However, when we talk about um, policy analysis, we also look at the gaps. And despite having a national ecotourism strategy and coordination of different national agencies, many tourism destinations in the Philippines are experiencing uncontrolled development that sort of halted during the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are fears that when the economy is now restarting in a bid to really recover, you know, we um, put economic recovery at the expense of sustainable development. Many, many municipalities are developing their tourism portfolios without proper planning and without putting the necessary infrastructure in place. And because we put uh, climate change as one of the risks, no, um, it's also important that we, you, we integrate climate change in, when we develop our municipal plans. Marine protected areas often lack adequate funding because they primarily rely on income from permits and allotment from municipalities coffers. There are also instances when policies have varying levels of applicability that lead to conflict among government bodies. No? So too many governing laws and bureaucratic red tape can discourage potential tourism enterprise owners and further investments. Yeah. So as a conclusion, um, ocean tourism, you can see from the presentation, is an important contributor to the growth and development of our country. 
Now, it's a very significant part of the economy. Um, there are a lot of potential for additional revenues for cities and municipalities, especially when we talk about job generation, skills developments for local residences and business opportunity. Because reminder that you know um, ocean, ocean tourism or ocean activity, ocean economy in general, has to be inclusive. It has to include, every, leave no one behind and to include the most vulnerable and the most marginalized so that they too can benefit from the um, income generated by these economic activities. No. You can see from our policy analysis that there is are still gaps despite the number of policies that are related to this particular uh, thematic area. So in terms of recommendations or how to move forward, you know, an analysis of ecosystems is in, in a destination is critical, you know, especially when that ecosystem has significant natural resource assets. You know. So we need to estimate the carrying capacity of tourism for that particular area just so we don't overdevelop. You know. And to for to make things inclusive, multiple stakeholders need to be engaged when we talk about tourism development in a particular area. You know. um, Multi-stakeholder is also a way to be more, more innovative you know, because multiple perspectives can lead to multiple pathways. Okay. Um, third would be infrastructure development. So an infrastructure needs um, it should be part of any tourism development plan. No, and that includes finance, financing mechanisms. One of the things we are looking at, for instance, uh, from a climate change perspective is ecosystem-based adaptation. So EBAs are solutions. They can be infrastructure, um, which have both environmental and economic benefits compared to uh, gray infrastructure or hard infrastructure. Uh, one of the things um, that can be done is also embedding payment for ecosystem services in the tourism products. So it's a way for you know those who benefit or, to, or partake in tourism products to contribute to ecosystem preservation and conservation. Okay, tourist limitation that. This is common in some areas of the world where in there are key sites. It's actually also common. Um, for, for for instance, UNESCO World Heritage Site. For instance, uh, I will be hiking in December um, in Mount Hamikitan, which is the only UNESCO um, World Heritage Mountain that we have in the Philippines. There is a very, very limited number of permits issued each day. Only 15 permits are issued per hiking day. So that's why it took us months to get that permit. But it is very important to limit those numbers because of the carrying capacity and the importance of the site as an ecological area. So number six would be to look at it from incorporating sustainability in business practices. This is something I'm very passionate about. In fact, we have an upcoming webinar on how corporations integrate sustainability as part of their business practices in November uh, and how banks finance that. No. Uh, and then number seven, local communities play a key role. Um, they can have roles, for instance, citizen-led enforcement. There's a lot of volunteers like Bantay Dagat, which can address poor enforcement of laws and policies because um, in a way that um, it just takes capacity building for the communities to understand you know, the importance of this kinds of um, citizen-led enforcement is to their area and also to their economic activity. And when we talk about um, further research, um, because the ocean economy is a relatively new term, even though we've all benefited from the ocean economy for decades, you know, there really is a large 
um, opportunity for doing research here. So from an economic side or a business case, a business side, um, we need to develop the business case for sustainability in ocean tourism enterprises across the different sectors, you know, fishing, tourism, um, transportation, energy, to understand the different modalities for success in terms of financial sustainability of the business in relation to environmental sustainability, as well as um, how you know, the ocean economy can also adapt and mitigate climate change. So that's it for my talk. Thank you for, for to everyone for listening. Well, thank you as well to you, Dr. Angie Safra, for the very insightful presentation. Well, Dr. Safra underscored the risks and challenges in ocean tourism, alongside, of course, what multiple stakeholders can do to develop the sector, maximizing its potential with a balancing act both for conservation and of course, economic benefits. So all our attendees, we have a number of attendees joining us in this webinar. Please, if you have questions about the presentation of Dr. Zafra, you may use our chat box, just type in your, your question there. And those questions will be addressed after all the presentations during the Q&A session. And also, if you would just like to let us know what agency you are from and say hi to the other attendees in this webinar, just give us a chat in our chat box. We'd like to know more about our attendees this afternoon. Again, if you have questions, use our chat box. Our Dr. Safra will address those questions about her presentation later in the Q&A. I see we have 83 participants in our um, econ talk this afternoon. So nice to have you here joining us in this activity. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Safra, for that presentation. And we will be moving on now to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael C. Huang. Dr. Huang was conferred a PhD in public economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. After serving as a researcher in Asian Development Bank Institute and GRIPS or GRIPS Science for Redesigning Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy Center, Dr. Huang became affiliated with the Ocean Policy Research Institute. As a research fellow from 2018, Dr. Huang is in charge of economic analysis for blue economy, blue bonds, and risk assessment of water-related natural disasters. He is also an adjunct lecturer for special economic seminars in the Faculty of Economics in Toyo University. Dr. Wang is a member of the Japan Society of Ocean Policy, Japan Economic Association, Applied Regional Science Conference, and Japan Castle Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our second speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Michael C. Wang. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And I'm very honored to be invited uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. And well, I really appreciate that uh, even though, well, it's, uh, it's still in the pandemic, but we can meet each other well, through line. And then I think we're sharing more inclusive uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of ideas. So allow me to share my, uh, my slides. So I think, okay, I think you're all with me. Okay, so everyone can see my slides. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you again for your kind inv invitations. Uh, my name is Michael Fong. And uh, as uh, well, last week, a few days ago, since I received this uh, invitation, I'm very, very happy because now everyone is aware that the, the economic security is important uh, with uh, a blue economy. Because since we are maritime countries that we all together, we, we, we link with this one, one oceans. Uh, the only pity thing is that I have not uh, been to Philippines yet. So maybe I, I'm not uh, able to provide some inside comments about Philippines, but I do want to share some experience in, in Japan. And the only, th also the thing that we connect is that, well, if I swing from Tokyo here, and then a few days later, I can be arrive Manila or the Philippine Islands. So uh, I belong to the Ocean Palace Research Institute of the Sasagawa Peace Foundation. Uh, this is a uh, non-governmental and non-profit organizations. And then we are one of the very few uh, policy, ocean policy uh, oriented uh, institute. Uh, we do everything about ocean from policy and then island and sustainability to Arctic Ocean and capacity building, marine tank security. And we are a think and do tank. 
and we hope to 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 help to to provide policies recommendation for the ocean governance, and then to the well, two hundred late years later, uh, of humankind. Uh, thanks for Maria's introduction. So allow me to also prov pr promote our uh, publications. If you search blue economy and blue finance uh, on, on, online, then you will quickly get the access of this book. This book is a free download and a free access. So feel free to uh, dig more from, from this uh, publication. Well, thanks, thanks, Maria. So I'm going to talk about well, the scope of blue economy. And then also, uh, I think the important thing uh, uh, from Maria is that Actually, regarding the economic security, I think in most of the country, the fishery sector, well, because they are the first industry, so maybe they suffer, they are more vulnerable in well, gaining the income, especially during the well, climate change or the, the natural hazard. So actually, Japan also faced the same situation. Uh, more severely, Japan is facing the severe well, demographic change that more, less and less people are in the uh, fishery uh, sector. This is why the, the well, increase the value added in fishery sector are very important. And I'm also going to introduce the blue carbon and then how blue carbon can be related with economic impact as well, economic effect as well. And later, I'll introduce the well, smart ocean uh, society kind of project in Japan. And later, lastly, uh, everything cannot be achieved without an intellectual or without, without people's involved. So I would like to uh, re remind everyone for the, uh, the ocean professionals, not just for ocean study, but for all kinds of professionals. Okay. A blue economy is a uh, now it's getting important. And I'm sure that everyone, all the uh, participant in this workshop, are already very familiar with this term. That this blue economy were connected to all kinds of uh, well in our life, especially that uh, Philippines and Japan, most of coastal country are all uh, marine time countries. Our life, our products, our goods, and our well climate change are all related with blue economy. Sometimes people may ask, what is the blue economy related with the well, green bound and blue bound? Actually, well, there's no kind of uh, separate this severely because uh, green means that we sustainably use the, uh, our environment. And then blue is just more related with ocean. And then if you're greening the use of the ocean, that is a blue economy. So in this picture, so if we just uh, uh, feel and then do the tourist in some place with uh, well, just just the most uh, nature-based way, so this is a kind of uh, well environmental. And later we have ocean uh, industry that we do the aquacultural or kind of well fish fishery with a huge vessel, and also some or simply the uh, wind farm, uh, offshore wind farm from the ocean. That is an ocean uh, industry that provide economic profits. So the concept of blue economy is that while you do the, while you utilize the ocean industry, you, but you still maintain the sustainable development. Well, the picture is quite uh, well small, but I hope you can see that even uh, there are just off offshore wind farm and they're also for land for aquaculture and then they, they grow the seaweed for blue carbon. So this part I'm going to go to show you the practice in Japan and then the, the development. Of course, uh, there are uh, some glossary to define blue economy, blue finance, and then uh, we are uh, also focusing on blue impact because blue impact is the process to provide the uh, evidence and scientific evidence for the, the finance to operate to, toward a blue economy. So if you look at this, this uh, kind of uh, figure, the blue finance, or for example, the blue bond uh, issued by ADB, so they need the, their goal is to to enrich the blue economy. But meanwhile, if we can find some uh, kind of re, uh, more uh, related with the R&D and innovation, and then also to create social impact, and that is the scope of uh, blue impact finance. So this is uh, not the main topic, it's just supplementary uh, for your information. And of course, the UN Environmental Program, they, uh, in order to stimulate, to promote rural economy and then provide a financial kind of a principle. So they do provide a, a principle for blue economy and, and finance. The key point for blue, for ocean, is more difficult than the land is that 
uh, it takes a lot of energy for uh, cooperate between well, university, research think tank, and then all the stakeholders. And it has to be transparent because uh, the, the, the money flow needs to be uh, with a lot of stakeholders. And then that's why the transparency is so important. And also being impactful, especially to the livelihood in the ocean. And then lastly, the well, science-led is very important. And then the, the invest, the scientific investigation for the ocean is very costly. So uh, it takes, uh, it will be very important for the cost share and then well, cooperate, cooperative. Well, as I mentioned that the fishery sector uh, in Japan recently, I think since last year, uh, we give fish passports. So this passport is means that where you get the fish and then also with the, the fishers information and then after they catch the fish and then it will be uh, given by the blockchain. So we, you will receive a QR code. So when you use a cell phone of the QR code, you can see oh, where this fish and uh, which farmer uh, caught it. So that provides a very important and transparent traceability for fishery. And also it will be a very important way to, well, to, uh, to, to prevent IUU. So, well, the implementation about this uh, fish passport actually in our latest presentation uh, kind of publication, that increases the general public's willingness to buy, which means that the fish uh, can be so, can be sold with higher price with this code with passport because more now people have more uh, kind of awareness to have a sustainable uh, ocean. So and then in economic regression that we get, uh, if if they if there is a package on this uh, fish, they will be willing to pay uh, 0.2 uh, in dollars for, for that. This is still a very preliminary research for just for one kind of fish and then in, in the Tokyo area. So we build that this is a very important evidence base that uh, with the traceability that we can have a sustainable fishery to the, from the consumer and then from the well, fishery sector to prevent the uh, IUU, illegal, uncontrolled and on, uh, uh, kind of uh, on, on uh, uh, kind of uh, regulated. Later, uh, I'd like to introduce the blue carbon. Blue carbon, now people like to discuss about the net zero or 2050 and then the CO2 emission. And then actually uh, the world is covered by the ocean and especially the fish were all mostly in the coastal area. So the blue carbon will provide uh, the, the absorb a CO2 and then provide fish a better uh, ecosystem to survive and then we'll have a more uh, fish fish resource. So blue carbon, well, in another name, is just the seaweed or the well, kelp. So they can absorb and, and then the CO2 and, and sink that is very important and then for the earth and to uh, kind of uh, decrease the, the acidification of ocean. So if you search a uh, blue carbon uh, offset creating, then you, you also see our uh, new publication on marine policy. This is open access. So once you insert the keywords blue carbon offsets, then you will get our scientific re research. Well, we take the Hokkaido as an example. Hokkaido is at the northern biggest island in Japan. And around the Hokkaido, there are the kelp, one of the seaweed uh, in Japan. The kelp, well, this is this kind of seaweed. Probably you you eat some well seaweed, in, and then this is kind of a thick uh, seaweed. Uh, I took this picture. I think six a.m. or five five a.m. in the morning. That uh, fishermen are also uh, harvest the the kelp, and then there of course there are also a very uh, the income and then the production is being has been declining, and then the aging aging problem also appear in the fishermen. And it wasn't that it, it was a nice uh, profitable work. However, well, with uh, more less and less people involved. So as you can see, the people involved, and somehow the the income is still sh shrinking. So the way is that, and then uh, this kind of uh, so as a food product also has an important economic uh, effect. And then now just not just for the the harvest, the food processing for a kelp. We use the input output analysis that uh, compare with the just the fishery, squee, and then sink, and then uh, other things. The kelp, this kind of agricultural culture, is also has a huge uh, 1.41 economic effect, which means that if you invest or there's a 
one million uh, in, uh, more demand for for this product, you will, you will expect it to get one point four one million uh, more income for for this um, industry in simple way. And then now, so in order to investigate what kind of area is suitable for blue carbon. And okay, another thing that I want to mention is that if we have the uh, blue carbon credits, this fisherman can only get earn money by selling the credits. So they don't really need to harvest the, the blue, the, the kelp. So that is kind of another secondary income just by planting the, the kelp as a blue carbon. So in order to investigate all over Japan, which area will be suitable for blue carbon, the our uh, model foundation, Nippon Foundation and Japan Hydrographic Association all together last week, they announced the map of Japan project. They will use the, well, the uh, airplane from the from the sky about 500 meter high to, to scan the well coastal area. And then we, this is the, uh, original map. This is the 3D map. And then the 3D map also, we can see about, uh, about 50 meters to 100 meters deep in 3D demonstration. So that helps people to identify which area has the potential for blue carbon. So this was the investigation I did. I was here in the, in the small vessels. So that was the, the investigation situation. And later I'd like to introduce the smart oceans. The, the example is uh, very near Tokyo uh, area. It's called Suruga Bay uh, Smart Ocean Consortium. Suruga Bay is uh, only a kind of small uh, bay. However, it's very deep. It could be one of the deepest uh, bay in the world because the deep is uh, to, uh, down to 2,500 2, meters deep. So there are a lot of potential for the investigation and also for the offshore well power and the hydrogen society as well. And then in order to achieve uh, the, a lot of the goal, virus of, uh, biodiversity and then security, and then for the marine time domain awareness, there are a lot of uh, platform data platform need to be established. So the fishery, uh, we, we will have the sensor on the fishery or even the fixed net. So whenever we got some fish in the net, and then we will realize that we, we don't need to check it uh, frequently, for example, weekly or, uh, or or daily. We only need to make sure that there's a fish and then we go catch it. And then if there, there's no fish, we can release the net. So these are all in the smart kind of way and also for smart logistic for the, uh, the a lot of uh, uh, global words. So sharing the information and then also the, the sensor is also one way to achieve free and open Indo-Pacific strategy through the ocean uh, studies. Another uh, point is that we use the uh, kind of autopilot, uh, autopilot uh, uh, logistics. So we, they, we did one from the Tokyo to, to Nagyo to Tsu. So the, in the way of a 900 kilo, 900, uh, 790 kilometers, I think 96% are autopilot. So because the, the personnel needed for uh, logistics is really crucial, nobody wants to do that kind of job. So we are doing for the well, autopilot uh, work. So this is a very well sophisticated simulation and then also to, to move away from other vessel. So this all require a lot of uh, uh, ocean technology input. So all in all, uh, all this technology input required uh, intellectuals. So in the United Nations uh, decades for the ocean science and sustainability 20, uh, 10 year, decades. So they emphasize about the eco early career ocean professionals, not just for the ocean or, or uh, kind of biologists, but for the engineering, AI, data scientists, IC design, bio, biologists, humanity, and something someone like me, the economist, to provide a comprehensive and holistic uh, well, kind of input and then the research toward the oceans. So it's announced my, my introduction. And then of course, I, I'm probably the only person lack of the experience in Philippines. So I look forward for some uh, vibrant discussion later. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu, Dr. Huang. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much for that presentation. And thank you for giving us a picture of uh, the fishing sector there in Japan. And we look forward how the Philippines could learn from the best practices of you there in your country. Again, arigatou gozaimasu, Dr. Wang. Thank you so much. 
All right, finally, we come now to our third speaker. But before I introduce our next speaker again to all our participants, if you do have questions about the presentation of Dr. Savra or Dr. Huang, kindly type in your questions in our chat box and our speaker would gladly answer your questions or queries during the Q&A session after all the speakers. All right, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come now to our third speaker, Dr. Ben Milligan. Dr. Milligan is a Science Fellow at the University of uh, New South Wales, Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the University College London Institute for Sustainable Resources, and a Visiting Senior Fellow at the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security. His research and advisor work focuses on use of environmental information in public policy making and on the design of legal, institutional, and policy frameworks for sustainable development. Ben currently serves as Secretary Director of the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership, coordinates the Finance and Governance Working Group of the Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership, and is a member of the expert group advising the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome now our third speaker, Dr. Ben Milligan. Thank you very much. And th thanks to the organizers and the our previous two presenters, Dr. Maria and Dr. Michael, for making my job easy because you already have such a wide range of information that you're able to take advantage of and reflect on. Uh, building off their presentations, I wanted to offer a few practically orientated reflections uh, on achieving a sustainable ocean economy in practice and some of the concrete steps that can be taken in policy context to move towards that uh, very positive vision, but also very complex and difficult outcome to achieve. So I'm, I'm going to be looking at the question of how to craft policy structures, institutional frameworks that might support development of more sustainable ocean-based development, uh, referred to here in shorthand as the blue economy. And I'm going to focus in particular on some of the measurement aspects of that challenge. In mainstream economic policy, Policy, mainstream macroeconomic development policy, there is a strong emphasis on policy design guided by aggregate indicators, the most famous of those being gross domestic product. And those kinds of numbers affect the trajectory of markets, they affect investment decisions, and all aspects of economic decision making, and they're built on a really rigorous system of standards. And, and one of the challenges I'm going to talk about a little bit is with this broader, more complex concept of a sustainable ocean economy or a blue economy, we have the challenge before us of creating indicators beyond GDP that look at sustainability, that look at inclusivity and other factors that reach the same level of rigor and investment confidence that GDP has enjoyed for decades. So that's given my role in the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership, which is an intergovernmental collaboration to support measurement of progress towards sustainable ocean development, I'm going to add a significant subcomponent of my presentation on that particular issue uh, in case it's of interest to colleagues in the Philippines. So with that introduction, I'll move on to my slides. Um, it's important to discuss in any uh, policy reform process related to the ocean or the ocean economy, the structure of that economy itself. And, and that structure is in many countries around the world. I can't comment on the Philippines context, but uh, can offer some remarks internationally. The structure of the ocean economy is, is changing. It's changing very rapidly in many parts of the world. The established sectors that often inform how we make decisions about the ocean, whether that's capture fisheries or the maritime sector, ships and ports, uh, tourism, which we just heard a lot about earlier, um, and ocean-related manufacturing and construction. Th these still exist, but they're, they're being complemented increasingly by what the OECD and other organizations describe as uh, emerging sectors. Uh, aquaculture and mariculture 
I would certainly not describe as emerging in the Asia Pacific region. They have very much emerged, uh, but we have rapidly growing interest in opportunities for offshore renewable energy. There are a whole range of economic opportunities associated with understanding the composition of the ocean environment, whether that is in the pharmaceutical sector or extraction of aggregates and sand, input of high quality sand into uh, technology manufacturing, uh, for example. So the, the phenomenon we are trying to achieve sustainability within and the goods and services and the enterprises that produce them are changing rapidly in many countries around the world. And they depend on a whole range of asset enablers. So to have ocean-based prosperity, we need appropriate infrastructure. We need uh, to have education support systems so that individuals have the right skills to be able to participate in the ocean economy. And crucially, as recognized in the Sustainable Development Goals and in, now in policy all over the world, we need the natural environment as the ultimate asset foundation of ocean-based development. So we, we need to move into a paradigm where instead of the environment being considered separate from the economy, we need to recognize and measure that the environment is an asset in itself, some often described as ecological infrastructure or natural capital, and that provides critical and in some cases irreplaceable um, inputs into mainstream and emerging economic sectors. And the slide I've shown here is, is just one national government illustration of that. It's taken from the UK government's strategic review of ocean policy, the future of the sea review. So that, that's the phenomenon we are dealing with. Uh, just some practical examples of some of the emergence of new ocean sectors between different sectors, between energy or fisheries or between shipping and conservation are breaking down. And that puts a lot of stress on the policy framework. So to give you a few practical examples uh, on the image on the left, we have a solar energy production facility that is co-located with aquaculture production. So this, this is a merger of two sectors that are typically treated okay. the, um... very differently. All right, um, yes. sir, I would just like to ask if your slides are being shared because we can't actually see the slides. If you could just um, click the share screen, please, so that we can see your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Milligan. Of course, Thank a lot you. about before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you very much. On, on the structure of the ocean economy. I'll share these afterwards as well. And, and these are some practical examples that I was just talking about. Thanks for interrupting. Please do so soon if there are any other problems. Um, this is the example of co-located uh, aquaculture and energy from, from uh, coastal China. And another example from the Philippines, I'm, I'm just uh, drawing attention to an active NGO collaboration in the Philippines uh, with uh, a public private sector collaboration around co-location of uh, coastal sea walls and mangroves. So nature restoration and built infrastructure are increasingly interacting with one another and that's being actively explored so that, for example, if you are building or investing in a new port and want to climate proof that port and also want to improve support for local fisheries, there are opportunities emerging in current engineering practice for combining ecology with built engineering solutions. So th these are just practical examples of this evolution of how you define the ocean economy that challenge policymaking. Um, and we're also seeing rapid uh, innovation in the policy space. So many countries around the world are rapidly developing different versions of cross-sectoral strategy and governance related to ocean-based development. And these are just a few examples from our region. So uh, colleagues in Vietnam are actively engaged in a national policy reform process around their blue economy. Uh, Fiji recently established a national ocean policy and complementing national climate policy that have a whole strategic framework for priority setting concerning ocean development. And then uh, 
also at larger scale in Indonesia, um, Bapanas and other ministries really leading a, a more strategic review of what can be achieved related to ocean development. And, and what I suggest are the distinguishing features of all of these diverse national processes is that they rethink how we approach the ocean from a governance point of view. Instead of focusing on individual sectors and dealing with those sectors differently, there is a growing attempt to coordinate decision-making across multiple ministries, uh, work more collaboratively with the private sector, and, and try to assess what optimal development scenarios are in accordance with different criteria related to sustainable development. So we, we're living very much in an era of change. And to make good decisions in an era of change, we need a, a whole range of innovative responses by way of policy instruments. So this diagram I have taken from one of the outputs of a um, heads of government process called the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. It's now comprised of 16 heads of state and uh, with an observer through the UN system, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. And one of the things that panel does is try to establish a degree of common understanding about opportunities in policy and governance related to ocean-based development. And this diagram shows what the panel describes as the key ingredients of sustainable ocean planning to deliver sustainable ocean development. Uh, these ingredients are we need area-based planning. We need to be making decisions about what combinations of activities are optimal from a, develop, a sustainable development perspective in different locations. Uh, that unlocks opportunities for cleverly using ocean space in multiple ways, like the energy aquaculture example from before. We need to combine economic development in a traditional sense with environmental protection, with social and equity considerations. And all of these need to be mainstreamed into every policy instrument and also into enabling finance. Uh, so this, this really challenges, again, how ocean policy is tr traditionally made. It's much more of a systems approach and it requires a lot more collaboration in practice. And designing all of this requires good evidence. Uh, if you're going to have good management of the ocean and development, you need good measurement. And so the foundation in the ocean panel discussions of sustainable ocean planning is ocean accounts. What do I mean by ocean accounts? I mean an extension of measurement of the ocean economy or ocean GDP to include a broader range of factors beyond GDP. But instead of doing that through individual assessments, actually incorporate those other indicators into the core of government decision-making, international statistical offices, uh, et cetera. And it, this is certainly a process that, um, as others will know more than me, is, is active in the Philippines context. And if you can measure the benefits associated with nature and how it supports development, it enables you to build cases for different kinds of financial instruments that focus on a nature positive vision of the ocean economy. Uh, it enables us to have more investment in management measures for the ocean, in good laws, policies, institution, and capacity. And when we manage the ocean environment better, because the environment is an asset, we get a greater range of goods and services from a healthy mangrove compared to a degraded mangrove, for example. And if we, we can measure those, it's easier to manage and optimize them and then reinvest returns in more sustainable aquaculture, for example, into better development outcomes more broadly. So there's a lot of thinking about how to design nature-based investment in interests uh, all over the world, uh, but fundamentally it requires well-organized data and transparent data. Um, and this also applies in the public sector. So within finance and economic development ministries, instead of just asking how do we optimize ocean-based growth or GDP or value added, we need to also be and we need to be asking how sustainable is that growth? Are the assets on which our growth depends um, 
being reinforced and strengthened so that future generations can enjoy that prosperity. And this, this is very similar in practice to how any large corporation manages its affairs. They look at their revenue and they also look at their balance sheet and the assets that underpin their revenue generation. It's really important we look past GDP because you can have positive GDP that is also strengthening ocean assets and benefiting inclusivity and equity, but growth is not inherently good if it's undermining prospects for future growth. So that's why having a broader range of measurement systems is so important. And fortunately, thanks to the hard work of many colleagues around the world, including colleagues in the Philippines expert community, we have international economic accounting, first agreed in 2012. That focuses on individual natural resources and their links to the economy. And then most recently, we have uh, a system of ecosystem accounting built on the SIA framework. It's now been updated into a formal global standard. I haven't updated my front cover here. This was still when it was in draft phase, but it's now in fully adopted phase. And uh, if we use both of these as a basis for organizing our information about the ocean, that is in principle very conducive to achieving a sustainable ocean economy in practice because we have the right indicators to measure what matters. And this third um, front over here, this is actually from the expert community involved in the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership. This is available on the GoUp website. And what it tries to do is delve into practical guidance for how you implement global standards in an ocean context, because these standards on the left here are generic. They're not ocean specific. And there are a lot of practical challenges about how you implement them in the ocean domain. Um, so to summarize why we need these accounts, well, we need to understand the environmental assets of our economy, how they're benefiting the economy. We need to open up how we approach cost benefit assessment, how we look at strategic planning within government so that it's not all optimized purely around GDP. We need to open up decision-making in boardrooms through frameworks like the Task Force for Nature-Based Disclosures. So they're looking at nature-related risks instead of just purely extractive opportunities. So there's a whole wide range of reasons why ocean accounts are important as a function of ocean-based decision-making. Um, a lot of action around the world is supported by the Global Ocean Accounts Park after this presentation, uh, but it's a support mechanism available to the Philippines and other countries to explore these questions and is very much scaling up its work program over the next couple of years, supported by some member governments. Uh, there's a whole range of political and policy commitments to do this. Uh, there was a heavy focus at the UN Oceans Conference recently on improving our measurement of progress beyond GDP towards a sustainable ocean economy. Um, so this is very much politically supported around the world. And I'm going to conclude by just emphasizing some opportunities uh, for strengthening blue economic security and prosperity that um, I, I leave without comment on their relevance to the Philippines context. Uh, others are better placed to judge than me, but I just hope they, they are useful to provoke some thinking there's an important opportunity in de-risking public and private investment in sustainable infrastructure and enterprises through better organization of data. That's why we really need to be broadening the scope of accounts, both in the public sector and the private sector, and really focusing on capacity building around that. Without better data to de-risk nature positive investment, we can't have that investment. It's as simple as that. Um, many countries also struggle with strategic coordination between ministries. This is hard in every country. For decades, ocean decision-making has been made in silos or coastally has been made in silos. So using new strategic objectives aligned with sustainable development goals, having area-based management linked to local planning and doing that across sectors is just really critically important, I suggest. 
And then finally, tailoring policy mechanisms to create incentives. So instead of moving from a regulatory paradigm where the environment is treated as a restriction on development, creating incentives for different kinds of development. And you can do this through things like payments for environmental services, uh, fiscal incentives for sustainable activities. So the taxation regime becomes favorable or other kinds of ways of making sustainable investment more attractive than cheap, short-term, unsustainable investment. So I'll, I'll finish there. Thanks so much for your patience. Apologies for the slide malfunction, and I look forward to questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Milligan. And speaking about questions, our participants have a number of questions. To all our speakers, may I ask Dr. Wang, Dr. Zafra, and Dr. Milligan, please, to um, turn on your camera and... Uh, we will be uh, addressing now the questions from our participants. There are a number of questions. And I would like to start um, bit with this first question from our participant. As the Philippines plans to, or as the Philippines plans for its development plan, what are the main policies that the new administration should consider in developing its blue economy? Again, as the Philippines plans for its development plan, what are the main policies that the new administration should consider in developing its blue economy? Probably we can start with you, Dr. Zafra, please. Yes. So the Philippine government will be releasing its PDP or the Philippine Development Plan by December. So the PDP outlines uh, what the current administration, the Marcos administration, plans to do in the midterm. So over the six year term. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of the PDP is continuing from the previous one, as well as integrating new policies and integrating new agenda items. And so um, when we talk about sustainable development, um, one thing that I'd like to see is um, sustainable finance mechanisms. Because when we talk about sustainable development and ensuring that you know environmental benefits are present uh, when we talk about economic development, that we are able to also address environmental issues. This actually requires financing. You know? um, if there's one lesson from COPs or the Climate Change Conference of Parties is that there is a big financing gap. So uh, that has now um, been the forefront of a lot of conversations in the country but also at the international stage. So the PDP should also include how are we to address financing gaps um, because we might design the best possible plan when we talk about you know, all our sectors, whether that's tourism, that's maritime, security, fisheries, and all that. But if we don't we are unable to finance this, the best plans will not be implemented. So we're talking about, um, for instance, one of the things that is in uh, is being developed um, and I'd like to see more here in the Philippines is financing um, ecosystem-based adaptation. So that's financing natural assets as solutions to climate change and to securing um, socioeconomic development. No, um, we've had conversations with banks in the financial sectors um, over the last couple of years. And right now, uh, they really don't know how to execute such things. No, how to integrate um, what Ben has mentioned, integrating natural assets as parts of balance sheets, as part of you know financial statements. Because um, if we involve the private sector, that needs to, to happen. So I'd like to see uh, the PDP contain those financing mechanisms, whether private financing, are we talking about blended financing, uh, international financing, and how we are able to sustainable um, move forward with our economy um, by financing solutions to our um, development issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Zafra. If Dr. Wang and Dr. Milligan would like to add to your insights, please, Dr. Wang. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, I think I really second uh, Maria's uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of recommendation from the government. And then I'll uh, just paste two links from the UN. Uh, EP, the kind of uh, suggestion for financing. One is the turning the tide, the other is diving deep. If you download the document, they provide a very sophisticated Excel sheet for the guidance. 
uh, we support the blue economy, not, not all the infrastructure. For example, I think also mentioned in Maria's presentation that now we should support is a kind of an eco-friendly nature-based kind of approach, not the great, great infrastructure, not if someone wants to build a huge hotel at coastal area, that should not be that financed uh, through the blue financing. It should be more with the uh, well, a kind of uh, uh, evidence base with the nature base, and also uh, we need to have a uh, th this uh, the evaluation assessment criteria hasn't really been done uh, so far. They only provide the scope. So now maybe the important thing is that uh, when there is an object uh, or project want to be implemented, no matter is for uh, supporting fishery uh, sector vessels or well, hotel for tourism, it has to be evaluated based on the indicators. For example, whether the structure is uh, as a nature based construction and whether it's a, uh, it's a, a personnel will be a kind of gender uh, kind of violence and uh, whether it has a clear idea for uh, carbon, uh, carbon reduction through its uh, energy, for example, they use more renewable energy, and whether it in contains more kind of collaboration with university in, in the kind of uh, uh, science led. And for another example is that when uh, we want to support for fishery, and when the fisherman wants to purchase the new vessel, and then we will be more uh, willing to support if the vessel will be used by the renewable energy or at least the more clean, clean energy. That will be the, the kind of scope. And then that will motivate the industry to change. So there will be more R&D for uh, producing a kind of more uh, uh, fr environmental friendly vessels. So that will be kind of a universal kind of approach. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Dr. Milligan would like to add, thank you. Thanks very much. My observation, again, building on what previous um, previous experts have mentioned, which I wholeheartedly endorse, is that to a large extent, this could be described as a coordination and goal setting challenge. So there is a rapidly growing interest from investors, sometimes at very large scale, in deploying capital in ways that are more sustainable, but their fiduciary obligations and other practical business constraints are difficult to overcome if there's not the right research product that demonstrates the utility of that investment per investment, not just in principle, because we understand in principle that um, Many nature-based investments work much better than non-nature-based investments, but that has to be demonstrated per project. Otherwise, the, the investor is not going to satisfy their fundamental obligations to clients as an investor. So it, it, that's one manifestation of the collaboration. Another is aligning interest of capital with public policy in a goal-based way. So this, and this is particularly in my personal view, an issue with international development collaboration of finance where the requirements of deployment of the finance or the sectoral priorities sometimes um, overtake cross-sectoral national policy priorities. So what, what are the implications of all of that for, I guess, design of national development planning? Well, if I guess sovereign governments can send a signal, a very clear priority, priority-based signal. And there's been a lot of success around that in the renewable energy sector over previous decades, where you have a clear long-term policy signal ar around what is wanted to achieve. And that helps the private sector to organize, especially if there's attachments of incentives to that signal. So it's about setting what clear priorities are in, in the policy and political framework, and then um, ensuring and backstopping a process which makes sure all relevant stakeholders are talking to one another. Because sometimes if you're sitting in a big financial institution, it's hard to understand how you connect with the needs of a small fishing community on an island. And we need to be connecting all of those different perspectives through data to capitalize on the potential of what we all agree, I think, is a better world of a sustainable ocean economy, but it's, it's breaking down those information and practice barriers. So yeah, to sum up, it's, it's very clear policy signals and a, 
a strategic multi-stakeholder iterative process because we don't know all the answers but we have to be required by a strong government drive to sit down and solve problems in the public interest otherwise we'll just scurry around doing all of our own things in the short term all right thank you for for answering that question and Dr. Zafra mentioned a while ago about the financing gap and this question is somehow related to that because the question is which country should the Philippines look for or look to for assistance and cooperation in developing the blue economy? Can we have uh, probably um, Dr. Zafra first? So there's actually a lot of ODA related um the Philippines receives a lot of ODA right now because we are a lower middle income country. But at the same time, we are transitioning to an upper middle income country. And that impl implies that ODA will decrease as we transition to that because it means that we are able to stand on our own feet compared to when we were a lower middle income country. So right now, there's a lot of activity. The government of Japan through JICA has a lot of sustainable development um, funding. Uh, GIZ also provides us with funding. A lot of it is channeled through UNDP. Um, OSAD FAT is also a big donor um, when it comes to uh, sustainability issues. You know? So um, there is such a thing called um, effective development principles. Um, when we look at assistance, we have to you know, we have to ensure that donor countries are a, are compliant to those principles, uh, that they adhere to those principles in which um, the most important thing is collaboration between the donor country, the funding country, as well as the Philippines. Because when you talk about effective development cooperation, it means that um, we are the ones... Um, designing these things, designing these programs, and that um, the funding is to assist us in our national priorities, in our national development plans. So the first and foremost is we have to get the PDP out there because the PDP is the main document that will align um, what our country's priorities are over the mid medium term. And then we work with these governments either bilaterally or multilaterally to to look at and present, okay, these are our needs. Um, these are the things that our country is um, prioritizing. Would you be able to help us? That's effective development principles. It's not donor countries imposing on the Philippines, but rather it's us um, being, um, you know, being proactive and working with um, donor countries, OECD countries, and asking for assistance that. Oh, these are our priorities, and this should um are there assistance um available for this particular um priorities? So uh, we'll probably see those once we have the PDP um out by December. Thank you, Dr. Zafra. Dr. Wang, would you like to add? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think uh well, economic security, of course, is more like a, a kind of an income or employment. But actually, uh, what I'm I'm finding some sharing points for each country, regardless about well, a developed country or developing country. Another important thing is that about about the ocean awareness and ocean well education. That even our foundation has been well helping for the well. There are two channels. One is the ocean we call a pioneer school for from we we provide a kind of a subsidy to to the from uh, kindergarten to high school for to support the design the course for ocean ed education so the they can have a field trip to the ocean and then see how real world fishermen work and then how and then have a brainstorming to provide well the new ideas for for improving the livelihood in in the kind of a more liberal way another thing is that the capacity building through the coast guard uh, or the uh, rule of law for ocean to uh, to evac to kind of a, uh, to to check the I I U to prevent the I U U from the coast guard. So we provide the fellowship for to the World Maritime University in Sweden. 
So while well, we are we are this kind of a capacity building, when they return for, for master degree, so when they return to their country, they have the knowledge and then also the global network for other Coast Guard officers to work together on that. And why the rule of law on ocean environment and ocean fishery are controlled, then the well, sustainable economic uh, feedback will re, re, uh, income or kind of reward will, will kind of be stability through this process. So this is a kind of a, the whole approach uh, well, from, from a non-governmental organization side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Dr. Milligan would like to add, thank you. Thanks very much. I'd just like to uh, offer some build on the foundation laid by Maria in terms of her comments related to uh, ocean uh, ocean related overseas development assistance. Um, and this builds a little bit in my experience in the Pacific with trying to scale sustainable finance related to um, the maritime sector. So Priority setting is one really important component without clearly defined national priorities. It's hard to organize greater investment in a sustainable path. And so, so definition of that through the PDP is, is a really important foundation. And then um, in the long term, I guess this, the security of a sustainable transition is going to depend on mainstreaming sustainability into most current investment. And that's that's inevitably requires addressing the finance gap through the private sector. So, so a key question becomes, how do you constructively engage with all existing investors in the ocean economy currently to identify the, the barriers? And those barriers are really diverse. They could be barriers related to um, just professional capability so with green gray infrastructure not having engineers who have collaborated with ecologists before to combine mangroves and seawalls so it can be very practical and related to skills or it can be more structural there might be disclosure requirements in particular areas of investment that don't include nature so that, that's really common in finance ministries a lot of finance ministries processes around economic assessment only very recently have started including uh, valuation of nature in their processes. So government resources are not allocated in ways that are nature positive. Um, and th those are really diverse and it depends on the sector in question. So having a good understanding of that lets you build up a matrix of what blocks do we need to get out of the way to let the private sector really energize behind these goals and development of ODA can be really useful. And that, that's so once there is a private sector based awareness of what the barriers are, then instead of ODA and like international development finance, non return development finance, focusing on like the primary issue in question. So a good example would be um, instead of investing a certain amount in MPA management directly, you can use that odor to create the conditions that enable the private sector to be investing in MPA management. And then, then you're creating a much more sustainable paradigm. But this requires a big shift in, in how we organize overseas development assistance flows, because typically they don't coordinate so well with one another and just pick immediate priorities but it's how you stage it so that you create the enabling conditions and reduce the barriers for investment at scale so yeah those are my remarks and i'll stop uh, those are very useful information thank you dr milligan due to limited time we'll be accommodating one last question well dr wang mentioned a while ago about ocean education and some of this question is related to that this is a question from a student so from the sector of the academe from Joe P. Castillo of BS Marine Transportation student um, from the Lapso Just Foundation from Bacolod. The question is, what would be the significant role of maritime college institutions in achieving economic security? How can we integrate this awareness, the, statistic, the statistical data and research presented in our curriculum or academe? Thank you. Um, maybe we could start with Dr. Huang, followed by Dr. Um, Milligan and then Dr. Zafra. Dr. Huang, please. 
Thank you. I think uh, as I shown in the last page about the earlier career, uh, area career ocean professionals, ECOP. Uh, actually, the ocean is very well uh, connected and infinity. So there, there should kind, all, all kinds of uh, professionals, all kinds of academy should will be connected. I would encourage the College of Maritime College to be more interdisciplinary. We have, uh, I think all kind of uh, ocean is inclusive in, in terms of a cultural history and then food, and then also with the kind of, uh, well, well, customs. So it all it related. And then once when you understand the cultural and then kind of the approach sites and you can utilize your professionals, no matter it's for engineering, no matter it is for, it is for the kind of biotechnology, well, for me, economic analysis, I think everyone can has uh, has one point to to contribute and then to connect it. So while well, that that means another kind of importance for liberal arts for and then for the well kind of ocean consensus in in the scholar and then and it has to be developed through the well a lot of uh, a kind of uh, a well brainstorming or or communication. So what I uh, in general, all in all, what I want to suggest is that well, be be liberal, be open for all kinds of uh, uh, kind of expertise, and then to absorb and then develop kind of a most suitable way or most appropriate for for your your uh, career and professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang, Dr. Milika. Uh, I I would endorse that. I think. It's, creating an environment where different specialists are interacting with one another to solve common problems is is really important and is not stereotypically how training is established as economists different kinds of economists lawyers social scientists having having this interaction somehow it doesn't have to be radical just giving greater exposure so that um common understanding can be found because these issues can't be solved in isolation and and capitalizing on the wealth of in international collaboration opportunities and learnings that the online world gives us these days all right thank you dr milligan and dr safi would like to add anything thank you yeah uh, maritime colleges in the philippines are prime are primarily focused on you know, maritime careers such as seafarers, you know, those in logistics, transportation, uh, shipping, um, so engineering. So when you're focused on that single discipline, um, then you have that expertise in the discipline, but you don't have an awareness of much other issues outside of that particular discipline. So I echo what uh, the two gentlemen have said before me, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary plenary education is probably the biggest thing right now. Um, you learn from different disciplines and how you apply it to your own. So if we're talking about maritime engineering, of course, that doesn't just uh, involves knowledge about ships and shipbuilding, for example, in engineering systems aboard ships. But you also take a look at the surrounding ecosystem and environment um, around you. Know, from where you derive those, you know, economic benefits. So um, Chad has particular CMOs on maritime education, just like in any other education. And perhaps these things can be incorporated in, let's say, electives, or you can probably have, you know, things like this, webinars or seminars, just to build awareness and topics that are outside of a particular curriculum or particular syllabus that's really does singular in its focus, whether it's engineering or transportation. So once you build, um, you know, integrate from the sciences, integrate, let's say, social sciences, you integrate humanities, you integrate, you know, uh, environment and other sciences, then you build uh, more well-rounded education um, systems and young people are more uh, well-rounded in their education. And these young people will be our future leaders in a span of a decade or so. And once you build that awareness from that early age, then that is incorporated into their decision making later on. So it's important, as Michael had said, that you really start the education early on these things. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Angie Safra, Dr. Michael Huang, Dr. Ben Milligan. We learned a lot from the discussions this afternoon. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. And indeed, I understand that our participants indeed learned a lot from your discussions. Thank you very much. And now it's time to end our forum. May I call on Dr. Deo Florence Onda, the Deputy Director for Research of the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute, for the closing remarks. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Am I being heard? Hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think from all the discussions we've heard this afternoon, indeed the oceans are important, you know, in sustaining and ensuring the future, not just of Filipinos, but actually of all humans. Um, for the Philippines, it was mentioned earlier that uh, for a country that has its 82% uh, of its ter territory underwater, developing the ocean or blue economy is actually inevitable to ensure the future of its people. However, based on the report of PEMS in 2018, the ocean economy of the Philippines only contributed to around 7% of the country's GDP. This is actually relatively small considering the country's total maritime area that is, that is again, around 82% of our country's territory. As discussed by Dr. Zafra in her talk, with the marine and coastal tourism actually being the most important significant contributors, the further uh, she further identified the sectors in this industry that can be expanded and develop to, to further contribute to the ocean economy. The National Academy of Science and Technology has specifically emphasized the importance of blue economy in sustaining the growth of the country in the future. But along with this is also the recognition of the limitations in terms of science, technology, and innovation to attain these goals. For example, Dr. Wang in his presentation um, emphasized the smart ocean strategy, which is basically an uh, anchored on our understanding of the ocean functions and linking of the technologies and knowledge available to exploit and sustainably manage the resources we have. He also emphasized the importance of financing to achieve the goals set for the blue economy. Dr. Milligan, on the other hand, also suggested the creation of new indices beyond the GDP that are more inclusive and equitable in actually assessing our compliance and achieving the goals of blue economy. For the Philippines, in line with the sustainable development goals, for example, we lack established indicators for several of these commitments, making it very difficult for us to assess if the interventions and the policies that we are implementing are actually having significant implications and effects, especially, due, uh, especially considering the environmental threats and environmental crimes that continue to pose uh, threats to our resources. Further, with the majority of the country's waters located in some of the most controversial and even disputed grounds, such as the West Philippine Sea, this also poses challenges to the country's ability to make full use and sustainably manage its marine resources. And exploit its ocean economy. Dr. Wang further emphasized that unlike the land-based resources, collaboration and partnership in the marine environment and the maritime resources that we have is actually more difficult given the possible contentions and the fluidity of some of our borders. There are limitations and gaps in the policies that can directly assist and contribute to the development of the economy in the Philippines. And this is evident across sectors in the tourism industry, environmental protection, maritime and trade industry, and even in financing. However, we have also seen um, uh, important and significant advances in the field of blue economy in the country in the past years. For example, uh, the inclusion of blue economy in the Pagtanao 2050 of the National Academy of Science and Technology, the establishment of the Marine Scientific uh, uh, National Academic Research Fleet that would allow more marine scientific research activities to be done in our waters, the increasing number of state universities and colleges that are offering marine-related courses and training, and even clamors to establish the department, a separate department of fisheries and ocean affairs. All of these developments are actually a recognition on the importance of the oceans in the future for country. Admittedly, the topic of ocean economy is very complex. It's multi-layered and even probably an intergenerational challenge that we need to tackle for it to be realized. But discussions such as this, the webinar that we've seen and heard today, is an important avenue to talk about the issue. So we become more aware 
and hopefully slowly develop policies and solutions to these challenges. So again, join me in thanking the speakers, the moderators, uh, the moderator and the organizers in conducting this important webinar. To close this, in line with the UN's Ocean Decade of Science, let us be reminded that we need to work each other for the oceans we need for the future we want. Again, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Onda. And indeed, we look forward for um, that the recommendations discussed during the presentations of our speakers would be um, implemented here in our country in terms of uh, developing, of course, the blue or ocean economy. Marami pong salamat, Dr. Onda. And again, our greatest appreciation to all the speakers for your wonderful and amazing insights. Salamat pong muli. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the very timely and very relevant discussion on achieving economic security through the blue economy of the Philippines. And at this point, again, we extend our gratitude to the speakers, to the government institutions, the think tanks, business actor, or business sector, Actor, rather, the academe, members of the diplomatic community who joined us this afternoon, marami pong salamat. And those who attended the forum, to all the professors, researchers, and students, members of the diplomatic corps, our friends in the business community, and all those interested in this topic, we hope to see you again in our future uh, forums, webinars, and other similar activities. As mentioned, we have the last of the four in this Econ Talks. That will be on November 29. So please do mark your calendars and we'll see each other again there. Stay tuned for uh, more announcements about um, the series. And again, on November 29, that's digital economy. That will be the topic. Follow our social media accounts on Facebook for more updates and information. And for our um, participants, please answer the post event survey in the attached link in the chat box or scan the QR code. And after accomplishing the post-event survey, our organizers will be um, sending you the details about the certificate for your attendance in this uh, very relevant and very insightful webinar. Um, those who will require a certificate of attendance, again, you will be required to accomplish the evaluation survey. Well, thank you again to all the organizers for having me this afternoon. Personally, it's also a learning experience for me just being the moderator in this activity. But I'm going salamat once again and Diane Carrer saying good afternoon and thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>